It's time for a revolution. At every point in his life, he was trying to do the best thing that he could to have no regrets. Don't waste your time. Well, I mean, I think the things that, that motivate you to, to embark on something this voluminous, um, I mean, it had to go beyond being a fan. Uh, for me, um, when I pitched the idea to Gail Zappa, Frank's widow, um, uh, I had nothing to lose because I honestly expected her to, to, to say no because um, she told everybody no. So I figured she would tell me no. So um, what, I, what I pitched her was that I didn't want to make a music documentary and I didn't want to make a piece of fan service, that I was really interested in in who Frank Zappa was as an artist um, and personally uh, the, the consequences of, of deciding to live a life like that at that period in American history. Um, and that's, you know, I'm, as a doc filmmaker, I'm very, I'm sort of primarily driven by, by characters that are not easy, that are not, uh, that are paradoxical or provocative or, or dualistic and that live in really interesting times. Um, so you can sort of tell these small personal stories that are set against kind of big sociopolitical backgrounds. Really? And yes. Okay, this aisle here is where some of the best known titles lurk. Here's stuff from the Hot Rats. Here's the original 24 track, Masters of Dynamo Hum, Dirty Love, Montana, Inca Roads, Redunzel. I knew I wasn't making an album to album movie, um, which with someone who made over 70 albums in his lifetime would have been a, like, a, like a 10 part series. Um, but I had no interest in, in that. And, and there, you know, Frank died 25 years ago, so there have been many, many, many live concert videos and films and other documentaries that look at different musical performances. And I didn't feel the burden of needing to do that. Um, I sort of felt like, look, if that's what you want, there's go get it. There's tons of it out there, um, which lifted, it was liberating because um, I really wanted to tell a very specific story about a man's life. Um, and, uh, and so I wrote a kind of three act structure going in that Mike Nichols, the editor and I used as, as kind of a blueprint. Um, but like any documentary, we also knew that we should throw that away whenever we needed to, um, and you know, not be slave to it. Uh, but I knew I wanted to tell kind of a, an, a, an intimate personal story of, of, of his life and, and the, you know, the, the, the consequences and challenges of, of being so determined to live this artistic life at that time. Do you think that perhaps you might, uh, in a year or two, be the new musical messiah, as in the Beatles and Presley 10 years ago and 10 years before that, whoever it was? I can honestly say that I do not think so. Zappa was not as big a commercial artist as, as the Beatles or Bowie um, or the Stones and, and, or Hendrix or whoever. Um, he was uh, uh, very, very famous and very respected and very well known. Like when I was growing up in the 70s, we all knew who Zappa was. He was on Saturday Night Live. All of our brothers, you know, had all of his albums. And it was he was a, a huge cultural figure growing up. But he was not selling the level of albums that those other artists were. Um, and it's something that we dig into in the movie. Some of that was absolutely by design. Like he was not really, in my opinion, he really wasn't a rock and roll musician by nature at all. He was really an avant-garde composer who used rock and roll, the rock and roll genre to suit his ends. Um, he was also an extraordinarily gifted guitar player. And, uh, and so those were aspects of who he was, but he, he, was revered by Bowie and the Stones and the Beatles, uh, but he was not on their level of commerciality at all. And Frank recently came back from a town near Brussels where they had a kind of a European pop festival. How did you communicate with these kids who speak Walloon, who speak Flemish, who speak uh, sort of a dialect of French? What did you do? I only talked to him once. 
What did you say? I said, I'm really glad that you, you guys had a pop festival in spite of the French government. <laughs> it's really very square. It's just very depressing, you know, to think of what Paris used to be famous for. <laughs> oh. Go ahead, bleep it. Frank was so um, performative as a person. So most of the documentaries that you've seen or most of the interviews that exist with him um, that are on YouTube, uh, he's, he's kind of putting on an act, right? And it's a very entertaining act. He's a very sardonic, very bright, very articulate guy, but you don't feel you're getting any sense of, of who is back there. Um, it's all control. And I knew that I wanted to get past that mask as much as possible and get into who he was underneath the mask. And, and that I felt I'd never seen anywhere before. And uh, so that was very interesting to me. And then when I did that, I started to realize what actually motivated him. And it wasn't as if he was a, uh, he'd been kind of accused or misunderstood as a, as a rock guy who really wanted to make classical music. Um, but the reality was he started making classical music when he was 13 years old, long before he ever picked up a guitar. So it really was his driving influence. And uh, this idea of him as a composer wasn't like my attempt to sort of, you know, class up Zappa in some way or to sort of try to give him a, a, a level of respectability, you know. I mean, it really was who he was. He started as a filmmaker and a composer when he was very, very, very young and fell into rock sideways much later in life. So these were, to me, genuine aspects of, of who he was as a person. Um, if I'd have found something different, I would have conveyed something different.